participating in this seminar, I, it always feels like a tremendous honor to me that is uh, undeserved. But you know, there are a lot of problems I've had in my life that were also undeserved, so I'm prepared to accept as many. <laughs> I do have a, I do have a certain view about books, uh, which which is really that most books are significantly less than the sum of the ideas that are inside them, and that uh, you know sometimes you have to write a book to get all the ideas out, uh, and so you always have two ways of assessing a book. One is as a complete uh, enterprise, and often that's a failure. And the other is as a series of ideas and nuggets and uh, detours and interesting thoughts. And I think when we read other people's work, not our own, when we read other people's work, we should adopt a, uh, a variation on the principle of charity. We should look at the work for the nuggets and for the interesting ideas and the interesting detours. And that sometimes the book itself is, is not successful as an argument from beginning to end, but sometimes making that argument is absolutely essential in order to get the ideas out. And uh, I think of a lot of people's work that way, and uh, that's all I ever aspire to with my own work, because reading the arguments from beginning to end will uh, prove depressing. <laughs> and uh, hoping to find a consistency and uh, insight from page one to Subject that I, subjects I've been thinking about much more than I would have otherwise. So and I, I actually really appreciate that because, and I say this in all sincerity, that I view my whole endeavor from beginning to end to be trying to see if I really understand the problem uh, rather than enough to see if you can understand what, what, what all the problems are. And the last uh, session was a great example of that, that when all was said and done, we found out that, you know, some issue led us to fundamental questions in constructivism against realism, and that at a certain level, you know, uh, even the most fundamental debate in that ethics is implicated. And I, I always believe that one thing I've always tried to teach my students is that work, don't work on big ideas and big problems at first because you don't know anything. And that really you should work on smaller problems because all the big problems are in the small problem. There's no such thing as a small problem. If you understand it fully, everything that's really big and interesting and deep is there. So you work that one hard enough you'll see all the big problems. You start with a big problem, you'll just be a lot of hot air. <laughs> you know, really, that is my honest view. Uh, I wish many of my colleagues in the old days had paid attention to it. <laughs> uh, but hot air was uh, part of the choice. So, um, so let, let me begin. So as I said, I began with the idea that 
we should get rid of the fraud policy. That's where actually where I began. I wrote my PhD dissertation on that topic, and it's in effect. And I would say that most of my career in about fraud law has not been trying to get rid of fraud law, but asking the question, okay, so were we to get rid of fraud law in favor of something else, what would we be losing? So what was distinctive and of value in tort law? And I kept, of course, playing with ideas, well, suppose, well, we, we, what about holding people liable? Well, we can hold them liable without them making them pay the victim. What about compensating the victims? Well, we have lots of ways to compensate victims without making the injurer pay. What about um, distributing risk? Well, we can have first party insurance. I mean, I even asked myself the question at a certain point, what would be so bad if we just had first party insurance and everybody had to insure themselves against it? We do it for health, we do it for a variety of other things. Why don't we just basically do it for everything? And we let people to decide what level of risk they want to uh, guard against by buying insurance. Um, that's a possibility. Well, what if we did third party insurance? We have the government pay for it. I mean, what we have is something that does a little bit of all these things and, you know, and does a sort of half assed job in each of them in some ways. Maybe we should try to separate it out and do the, uh, the appropriate response to wrongdoing on one side and compensation on the other side and insuring in some other way, the distribution one. But, you know, tort law does a little bit of everything. But the question is okay, it does a little bit of everything, but of what that it does if we got rid of it, I mean, it's not like we couldn't. Would there be something we couldn't do? Is there something we're missing, or is it just that this is a pretty cool and efficient way to do a little bit of a lot of things, or is there something distinctive it really does? And that's mostly what I've been interested in trying to get a handle on. And, you know, at some point I hit on the idea that maybe the thing it does that's distinctive is corrective justice. Now, Many people took me to mean, therefore, a view which I never actually held, but I certainly think it's perfectly fair to attribute to me, because I never gave anybody a reason to think I didn't hold it, but I never did hold it, that tort law is just about the remedial side. That's, that's an odd thing to hold. To, I never held that. Why would I hold that view? Tort law is about norms of behavior that are supposed to govern how people are supposed to interact with one another. It's not a question about, tort law is just an institution uh, that responds to, to, to wrongs. That's crazy. It's got all these rules that are designed to encourage people to behave in certain ways to take other people's interests into account. So that's what it, it certainly does that. The question is, but so do other areas of the law. What are the distinctive rules it has, and how does it respond to those? Those are the features that are distinctive of tort law. Namely, does it pick out distinctive set of norms for regulating human affairs? To which the answer I ultimately came to is yes, they're basically relational norms, norms that impose duties on a particular person, which they already have, but makes them legally enforceable to uh, uh, regard other people's interests in a certain kind of way. And then it responds to that failure in a distinctive kind of way. And I thought that mixture, that mixture was best explained by corrective justice, including the fact that the, the primary norms were norms that were relational. That was also best explained by corrective justice. And then, of course, the question was, okay, what do you mean by corrective justice? What's the value of corrective justice? What's its relate? Is it a principle of justice? And all that <coughs> sort of stuff. Okay? So, I would, I, the, the view I ultimately came to in the last few years, which I didn't, don't think I published, but I, that I ultimately now which I am rejecting before I fully publish it, which is good because it's just one less change I had to make in my view, one fewer change, is that what I said earlier today, that the, that the, the distinctive feature of tort law is its relationship to the values we associate with certain forms of accountability or agency. And that my fundamental disagreement with, uh, say, the law and economics review, whatever million agreement, disagreements I had, was that a, we had a different concept.
conception of how to think about liability in torts. And that they thought about liability in torts the way I did at the beginning. And I was a captured by this way, that liability is an allocation question. You got losses or costs or something, and what tort and what you have to do is allocate them. And you can have various purposes and goals for allocating them. One thing you might want to do is you allocate losses so as to minimize them, or fairly distribute them, or you know, depending on whatever your, your standard is, it's that the losses and liability is a judgment about who bears them. And that liability, therefore, should be thought in terms of allocation. That tort law was basically an allocation system. Now, the truth of the matter is, to be sure, a consequence of tort law is that things get allocated, namely costs or losses or harms or whatever. But that doesn't make liability judgments aimed at allocation. It's a consequence of liability judgments that there is an allocation, which is different from the idea that the point of a liability judgment is to allocate. The, the basic thought was that in modern economics, the point of liability is to allocate. And that's why economists, for example, when they think of tort liability, they think of tort liability when the victim has to bear the costs. And it doesn't get shifted to the inverse, that the victim is being held liable. They don't have any difficulty with that expression. Victim liability. In fact, if you read the early work of uh, Calabresi and some of my work, you'll see the view that uh, in an article I wrote called The Morality of Strict Tort Liability, I argue that a strict liability and a fault liability were actually mirror images of one another. Because on uh, strict liability, that one way to look at that is that the injurer is liable unless he can establish that the victim was at fault. And fault liability is the idea that the victim is liable unless he can establish that the injurer was at fault. They just differ with regard to who's liable when both parties are at fault and who's liable when neither party is at fault. So that meant, that was, you know, that only makes sense. It's kind of cool sounding, but it only makes sense if you think that the bearing of the cost is a judgment of liability. That liability is just about allocating the cost. And you take the cost theorem, and that's just another version of the same thing. You know, namely whether fencing in or fencing out, it's a question of whether this is a cost of ranching or farming. You're just allocating cost, allocating risk, allocating something. And that's what liability does, it just allocates. Now I realized, of course, <coughs> that all the work that I had put into this, this <coughs> notion of corrective justice and whatever else I was thinking about, surely must uh, have a different conception of liability in mind. The early work did not, because the early work was whether distributive justice required that the, the allocation be based on fault, whether uh, efficiency required that the allocation be based on fault, even whether corrective justice required that the allocation be based on fault. But later I came to see that the notion of liability that's involved in torts is not liability as uh, uh, allocation. I started to think it really is liability as accountability. That it's a way of being accountable to, not accountable for. It's a responsibility that you have to answer to somebody else. And the whole idea of the bilateral criticism or gesture, the whole idea of the relational dimensions of tort law, the whole idea of the power to impose the liability, the whole idea <coughs> of the secondary duties of repair that you could call the demand of another person, the very idea of an injunction as a way of stopping someone from imposing certain kinds of risk on you is in turn, in turn uh, it's best thought of in that someone else is getting very, consequence of engaging in certain activity help to create a certain kind of accountability relationship in which the persons who are put at risk have under certain sets of conditions a status or a standing to demand certain sorts of behavior from others. Namely, that they regard their interests adequately and appropriately, that they can't treat them as
failure to discharge the obligation to show adequate regard for another created a secondary claim, which was a secondary set of demands that you could make, namely, that you are now accountable to me for the harm that you caused me as a result of your failure to discharge your primary duty to me. And that it's up to me. I now have a sign, a kind of control with regard to you that limits your freedom, just like I did in advance. I have a certain kind of right to demand of you that you behave in a certain way, that you constrain your behavior, you take my interest into account in a certain way. Because I had a certain kind of authority over you as a result of our relationship. Now, your failure to do that gives me another kind of authority over you. That is, it gives me a right to demand of, of you a certain form of redress, repair, compensation. It's something I can waive if I choose. It's unlikely that I would waive it, but it is something that I can waive. <clears throat> and that is, I now have a certain standing with regard to you. Right? And that the fundamental feature of tort law is less about losses than I, you know, gains than I focused on before, and more about the normative structure of this relationship of accountability. That, that was the key idea I was working toward, which I thought would explain, help to explain, both the centrality of corrective justice, namely why these elements are so valuable and important, and it would also help to explain what people like uh, Zapersky and Goldberg emphasize when they talk about the power to impose a liability. That is, the right way to understand the power to impose a liability is part of <coughs> the scheme of uh, accountability. It's the way in which you're accountable to me when you wrongfully injure me, is I have secured as a result a certain kind of power over you to demand or to impose a liability that is mine. And that you're constrained now in certain ways by what I'm free to do and what and I and the, and the state recognizes this by allowing me to call upon the state to enforce this against you and so on okay and that was <clears throat> I was about to publish this idea thinking that you know that, that's the missing ingredient in my work uh, on all this is the emphasis on accountability versus allocation that really it's two different views about the way to think about liability in the private law. One which is not just restricted to the economic analysis of, of law, but paradigmatic of it, namely that it, it's an allocation issue. And the other is that it, it's a form of accountability. It's a mode, it's a way of being accountable to others. And I thought that was an insight, you know, and right or wrong was an insight for so that's, a, that's enough for publication. In fact, by my lights, and I hope by your lights, much less is enough for publication. You know, and having written 20 pages is enough for publication. <laughs> you know, I actually felt, okay, this would be an addition to my views, and it would supplement my views and be a valuable thing. And then I started thinking about, okay, <clears throat> what are the features, actually, of tort law? And are they compatible with with seeing tort law as an accountability relationship. So the first thing I looked at was something I'd always thought about, which was insurance, right? The fact that uh, I, uh, the person who's being held accountable or standing to account is a person who's able to discharge their obligation by insurance. Now, uh, does that mean that, does that undermine the accountability idea? And I thought, well, no, that really doesn't undermine the accountability idea because you're still accountable to me. That is, I have the duty, I have the power to impose upon you a liability, but that it doesn't mean that I get to control all the permissible ways in which you can discharge that liability. That would be a different kind of accountability. That would mean I can not only demand of you <coughs> that you have to answer to me, but I can demand which answers are permissible and which answers are not. And that, that doesn't seem to be a problem. That doesn't seem then I started thinking, well, you know, there's something really interesting about tort claims. So I said to myself, suppose this were true, and of course it turns out to be true, that the people know much more torts than I do, can tell me that all the things which I say are true are only less true than I think they are, but here are a few things. One 
John is, if John came up to me and said, look, Philip, I understand that you're suing uh, Jordan, and that Jordan has got a lot of money, he's going to keep this up forever, and you're never going to be able to make this uh, suit work out. It's just going to drive you into poverty here. So the, I, I believe in you, Jordan. I, let me support your, your first claim here. Let me pay for your lawyer. Let me do this. But <coughs> And he gave to me as a gift. All right? And I said, well, that's, that's fine. Great. John's a wonderful friend. And then John comes back and says, and I'm, I'm stuck with the same, a different kind of, same suit, same kind of suit next year. Same guy. Right? He says, you know, I don't have that much money to give me to but what I'd like is a little piece of your tort action back in response. Right? I, I'd, like, I'd like part of the money back. Well, the said, oh, that's okay, that's okay. And I don't think anybody would think that's really a problem. Then a year later goes by, and he says, Jules, any, uh, I'd like to offer you a whole claim. I, I don't really even want the money. I want to be able to... Uh, Proposal. I want to be able to collect the money from Jordan directly. I don't want the money to come from you and then you give it to me. I, I want the money to come from Jordan directly. I want him to pay me. And I said, well, that, that's fine. I mean, what's the big difference between me getting the money from Jordan? It's just reducing a transaction. I might me get the money from Jordan, then give it to John. And a couple of years go by. I'm in suits all the time, apparently. And uh, John says to me, Jules, are you involved in any lawsuits? Uh, anybody injure you recently? And I said, yeah, there are a few people who have injured me. I'm thinking about suing them. I'm not really sure. He says, well, you know, uh, I'd like to buy those claims from you. Uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, I, I, I'd like a piece of that action. You know, and uh, I said, well, you know, uh, how, how much can these actions be worth? He said, well, you know, I'm, I'm willing to pay a fair amount for these actions. He said, but on the other hand, I want you to show up in court because it's, it's going to be hard for me to prosecute this case without you appearing as a witness. And I said, well, I'm a very reliable guy. And he said, well, I know you're reliable, but I'm going to discount how much I'm willing to pay by the probability that you're going to show up and the likelihood that it's a winner. So I'm going to give you a certain amount of money for a half dozen of these claims. Then Carlos, a few years later, this goes on. I said, that's fine. That's fine. We sue these cases. And Carlos shows up and he says, you know, hey, John, I hear you're in the business of <laughs> buying homeless claims. You know? He said, you know, we should probably put together a business of buying claims, right? Uh, there are a few of us because there are a lot of people who won't pursue their claims because it's not worth it for them to do it. They don't have the resources to do it. And even with uh, the lawyer's fees being uh, conditional in some ways, contingent, they, they still won't do it. But, you know, if we have a lot of resources, we can pursue all these claims. You know, and these are all these wrongdoers out there, perhaps, and they should stand in response to somebody, and they form a corporation, right? The John Carlos Corporation. And what they do is they purchase tort claims, right? Now, they don't purchase personal tort claims, because that would be hard. They do property claims, because they don't want to cause any trouble with the courts, worrying about whether it's allowed us for personal injury or, but for property claims, they figure, well, you know, property is property. That they'll do it, and you know what? They do this in England, and of course in England and the UK, this is a permissible thing to do. Right? So now there are all these things about my claims, right? Now, it seems very odd to say the least that the right way to think about this relationship is that Jordy is accountable to me, right? Now, there are some things <coughs> that if Jordy owed anybody anything, he'd owe me an apology, right? But there's no problem in thinking that he owes them the money, right? Now, the basis of his owing them the money has nothing to do with anything he ever did to them, right? It has everything to do with what I did with them, namely make a trade. Now, without going into enormous detail of playing this out much further, considerations like this were moved me tremendously to think that I had not thought at all about the plaintiff side. I thought about the, the 
defendant's side and insurance. But I hadn't thought about the plaintiff's side of the claims and what it was. Right? And that it might it might be just as helpful and illuminating to think about it as a kind of asset that I have that's marketable. Now, if we thought that the fundamental notion being expressed in tort law was a notion of accountability, we might want to give pause before we were to endorse systems that allowed me to treat this claim as if it were a tradable commodity or asset. On the other hand, if we thought about this in another way, which is also morally quite defensible, namely as, look, <clears throat> this, is a, this is an aside from my main point, but I just want to make it. It's not like it's objectionable. It's just not, it's objectionable from the point of view of accountability. It's not like it's objectionable from all moral points of view, because a perfectly plausible moral point of view would be this. Look, what you did wrong to me in the first place was rob me of a certain kind of control I had over resources by injuring me or harming me or taking away some of my property. And what I'm seeking from you in the first uh, that is some appropriate response that would give me some resources that I can control instead. Now, that is, I, what you did was rob me of a certain kind of autonomy and control over resources in pursuing my projects, plans, and goals, whatever <coughs> I'm trying to do in my life, and I'm suing you to get something back from you. Now, if I can get that thing back from you in a variety of different kinds of ways through this asset, why would we care whether I, I got it in advance by someone entering a market? Now, there might be objections to this market, but they're not these objections. There are other kinds of objections, like who's entering the market, who's most vulnerable in the market, what's the distribution of claims, are we going to get a million false claims, are we going to have more things going on? Those, those objections I understand, but this, it, they're not this objection. They're not this objection. And I say, well, okay, well, that's an interesting feature of tort law. And it might undermine my view about accountability being fundamental to it. Okay? But that was just the start of my demise. Right? I, I wanted to turn this insight not only into something which was critical of me, but something I was richer. Now, this basic idea was all presented to me by a student of mine. Right? He gave me a I started developing and playing with it. Okay. Excellent. A guy named Jed Lewinson. Excellent student. Uh, be a great witch. So, um, but when I started thinking about it further, you know, it became the following. Now, <coughs> torts is, is different than, say, promising in this regard. You know, because it would be an interesting thing if I promised Jordan that I would mow his lawn. And he, therefore, as a result of my promising, had a right that I mow his lawn. Now, he couldn't then turn to Diego and say, Diego, I know you, you really like to see Jules work for you. You know, I mean, all this relationship you had over the years, and you, you really like to be in a position of having some control over him. Right? So what I'm going to do is, you know, Jules made a promise to me to mow my lawn. I'm going to give you that promise. I'm going to give you that right. So you, from now on, you can tell Jules he's got to mow your lawn. Well, it wouldn't work quite that way, right? Because when you came to me and said, Jules, you got to mow my lawn. Jordy gave me the right to have you mow my lawn. I said, well, excuse me? How is it that Jordy gave you the right that I mow your lawn? I didn't promise you to mow your lawn. I have nothing to do with you. My problem, I'm, my relation is with Jordy. Jordy can't transfer to you without my approval right for me, the obligation for me to mow your lawn, unless we thought that what I had given Jordy was a uh, chip. You know, I had agreed to whoever has this chip, I mow that person's lawn, and then the chip he gave to uh, Diego, and what I had done was promise that whoever had the chip, but if I had promised that Diego, I would mow, uh, uh, Jordy, I would mow your lawn, then not only that, Diego can't even say to me, absent a delegation, not the same thing as an assignment 
by joining the Diego. He can't say, I am demanding of you that you won't join the Quran. If, if, you know, without, and you say, well, he assigned me that uh, right to do that. I say, no, no, no. He might be able to delegate that right to you, but he can't assign that right to you. You say, wow, we've got so many philosophical distinctions here. I'm not going to mow any lawn at this rate. Yeah. They say, well, okay, that's an interesting feature of promising. That doesn't seem to be similar to the features we have in court law. Both of them involve obligation. Both of them involve personal obligation and rights. And why would it be that when it comes to the tort liability, that it does seem to be whatever constraints we think are appropriate, they are certainly much freer with regard to treating them as assets. That may not be true in the case of promises. And that brought me to uh, what I think is, I'll summarize as my, my thinking on this subject now. My thinking goes something like this, and, and uh, th this is all preliminary. My, my thinking is that if you think of an institution like promises, we have a pretty deep and full and rich understanding of its uh, normative character and its uh, uh, normative dimensions and structure and the kinds of obligations and uh, normative relationships that arise as a result of it. So among those, well, we could have had an institution of promise different than the one we have. But the one we have means that people who are promising to have a certain kind of understanding with regard to me, that they can't just transfer to anybody voluntarily because uh, for whatever reason. Right? On the other hand, that's not true of all promises. Right? It depends on what you think of like debts, certain debts they can transfer to a uh, cash or all of a sudden there's a debt of a certain kind and a promise that you're acting on. General, this is true, but not true of tort law and of compensation. And my reason for thinking that that's so is that while we have a deep and rich and full morality of promising, we have a very thin conception of justice and compensation. A very thin conception of corrective justice. It's something like, you know, the John view is some version of if people wrong us, there's an appropriate kind of response that they're supposed to make and that we can call upon them to make it. And most of the details beyond that are not part of our concept of it. They kind of get played out in the institutions that embody that idea. And it's only through the institutional embodiment do we sort of fi feel, figure out what the rest of the idea is. And that's not true, for example, of promises. And that puts kind of, interestingly, it kind of puts uh, torts and corrective justice somewhere in, in a different, you know, it, it's fundamentally more conventional, less philosophically deep, less philosophically fundamental than contracting. And on the other hand, more fundamental and deeper, by my lights, than property. Because property, when we think about what, kind of what, what, is, pro what is the morality of property, I think you know, there's very little we can say you know, without seeing how, or what our proper institutions of property are like. What are, so the conventions that we adopt around property kind of tell us what our morality of property is. We have very, very little by the way of a morality of property that, you know, it would be an odd thing to say, I'm gonna study, I'm gonna do a work, uh, I'm gonna do a top-down theory of property in which I 
get the moral principles that govern property, and I'm going to see if they're actually embodied in our practice. It's much more likely that what we want to do is look at the incredible pra number of practices we have that govern property relationships and try to figure out what our morality of property is that are from the, from the middle up or the bottom up. Right? And that's part of the bottom up methodology in, in tort law, the middle up, because it's a little bit of we have some basic idea of what corrective justice is. We have some constraints on the concept. Th this idea of what is in some ways in the practice of principle, but that there was a feedback relationship that seeing how it got played out in the institution also helped to fill out what our underlying conception is of corrective justice. Right? Um, whereas when it comes to thinking about promising and contracts, but it, it's not surprising that those who believe in contract and promise, like John Schiffman or Charles Shree, they kind of say, oh, this is what promising amounts to. You know, here's a good example. When you make a promise to somebody else and you fail to uh, comply with it, that person doesn't owe us. We, it seems like odd for us to say, now, give me a special reason why you want specific performance. What, uh, if, I, if I promise to paint your house yesterday and I don't paint your house, small house, and today rolls around and I'm perfectly capable of Paint the house. You say, well, Coleman, come over there and paint the house. I say, excuse me, I'm just paying expectation damages. There, you know, they say, you have to give me a special account of why it is that I should be paying, uh, doing specific performance. And you think, oh, no, that, that, is not, that is not required. So, so deep is our understanding of what promise and the practice of promising is like. And that's what makes them so puzzled about expectation damages in, the, in, the, in contract law. Because in contract law, it's the opposite. You need a special explanation for why you're asking for specific performance. Expectations are the, and this is a puzzling departure for them. As opposed to in tort law, we would not have that kind of attitude. We want to say, well, we're learning something about the nature of the duty of repair. It could be discharged by third parties. You know, we have all these things that we're learning about what compensatory, compensatory justice actually requires by looking at our institutional practice. And this gave me a Yet another view that I thought I want to work on and think through, which would be how conventions, especially legal conventions, <laughs> figure in determining what it is we have moral reason to do. Right? Um, now, as positivists, of course, we hold the view that there's no necessary connection between law and morality. We don't hold that view. We have to, I, I know I hold that view. But I mean, something like that view is okay. Um, but, but the thought is, we don't deny that the way the world is, including the way the law is, contributes to what we have more reason to do, it would be odd otherwise. Right? So the thought here is that part of what this project it invites us to think about is the various ways in convention, the ways in which conventions generally, and legal conventions in particular, contribute to uh, what we have more reason and what our underlying moral conceptions are. So when, when it comes to things like corrective justice, so to go back to the main theme, it looked like the view I was starting out with was the view that the thing that would be lost was corrective justice. <coughs> and that's a big thing. And what would be lost about corrective justice is this accountability thing. But on reflection, the accountability relationship is not fundamental to tort law or to corrective justice in the way in which I saw it. But what we'd be losing in some ways is, in fact, the uh, tool, the instrument, a fundamental instrument in practice by which our conceptions of what justice and repair actually calls for and amounts to. What, what the prevailing conception of corrective justice is. We would lose access to um, the tools for determining and fixing the contents of that concept. It's not that we would be losing the values associated with corrective justice as much as we'd be losing the opportunity to discover
I'll apologize, I'll go to debtor's prison, I'll do whatever, but you're not going to end up with your resources, right? So from a moral, uh, a different kind of moral perspective, it's actually a good thing, not necessarily a bad thing. And I think that's where the future work is, uh, trying to navigate our way through those two perfectly uh, plausible, but very different in emphasis. They can be made to come together, but they also can be pulled apart. And tort law, I think, goes back and forth between the two. That is, and I think that it allows this sort of marketability with regard to property torts, but not with regard to intentional injury, and maybe not with regard to uh, personal injury generally, or is reluctant to do so, as a way of saying, well, we're, we're interested up to a certain point, but not up to another point. I'm just sort of pointing out, and I'm, you know, I, it, it, does want, it does help me advance my thought that um, that uh, we run the risk when we work in various areas of law of over moralizing things. Over moralizing. We find something rich, deep, and important about the morality of an area of the law, and in the same way that C. L. Stevenson found something in the nature of moral predicates that they have an expressive dimension. Uh, but what he did was misconceive moral predicates and think that this was all there was to them and that the, there was no logic of moral discourse. And we run the equivalent problem of thinking that everything else that goes on in the areas of the law that we study are Sometimes they are, or, but are, are not, not, more, not morally deep and rich. And the law, the fact is that the law may not be particularly morally deep or rich. Uh, we, as you pointed out, that Rat says, what was the phrase that Rat uses in it? Yeah. Well, you're getting older. Discharge that if you become insured, uh, but they have to pay for it, uh, and that's something which seems to be, uh, and, and I think that's sort of the bottom line. It's uh, we, this is a practice where we uh, finally and eventually ascribe these consequences uh, to the defendant. You, they're your stand to fork. You have to stand. It doesn't matter.
you had to say that this possibility for the climate to become a potential second reaction. It doesn't matter when you think you should go deeper and trying to explain the practice uh, as an uh, instantiation of a sort of deeper idea. Uh, we could, could we just forget about that? Uh, I think the world would be totally different if we said that. Uh, well, I don't think we can do without that. The question is whether we can do without formal as a mechanism by which we express that. It's kind of hard. That's the thing about tort law. It's it's mixed. Hal Graves is right. It's mixed. But he was wrong about what was mixed. He goes a mix between contracts and criminal law. It's a mix between all the different dimensions of responsibility that figure in our lives and all, all the aspects of what things that happen in the world are ours to answer for. In addition to the idea to whom we have.
fact that we agreed that we will uh, do something on EGO without his consent, he was not there, and then and we, we do that for Leo. But as you said, and also uh, you refer to Shona Schifrin's arguments against expectation damages, that, sent, that, that uh, part of contract law, at least in the common law, because in the civil law it's a bit different, um, uh, it's very thin in the sense that, that the rule seems to be that uh, I can choose between uh, uh, performing what I promised to do or alternatively paying you compensation for that. So I, I'm not sure where I would go along the way of saying that that tort law is thinner because when I study contract law, there's a way in which that part of contract law, which seems to me very, uh, it's one of the main sides to contract, make, makes it very thin in a way that I don't like, if I uh, more like it. But it is a civil law contract that expectation damages is one. Uh, so, is so is efficient breach. So is efficient breach, yeah. So, but I think, you know, contract law. This leads people to think that contract law is not about promises. None of the things I mentioned lead people to think that tort law is not about threats of justice. That's the funny thing. If there are things that lead people to think that contract, that tort law is not about threats of justice, it's not these features. It, it, it's not the insurance. It's not assignability. It's uh, that wrongs are really best thought of in terms of uh, duties of uh, efficient uh, investments and precautions and so on. Um, it, it's the thing that has to be the cheapest cost avoider of figuring out what wrongfulness is. It's not really about these structural features. Whereas in contracts, it's these kinds of structural features that make people think it's not really about promises. Because if it was fundamentally about promises, Second. 
not permissible because punishment, the liability to punishment is based on bridge reservoir. And that person has done nothing which makes them reservoir. So once you have the underlying theory, and of course you might think that's part of what goes on with people worrying about private prisons. And if they worry about private prisons, they're worried about who it is who would have the power to impose legitimately, whether that's the kind of authority that they can delegate or assign to somebody else to do. Uh, because the, the person they assign it to, a private prison, is not speaking on behalf of everybody. He's not acting on behalf of everybody. Uh, they're acting under a contract to uh, impose an evil. And so punishment requires that the people who impose the evil in some way are people who are authorized to speak on behalf of everybody to do so. Uh, in some, you know, you can make that. And now, so, so I think that was the prevailing view, that you, you have the primary institutions of liability, never articulated this by us. They have the secondary institutions, and if you get the morality of the primary institutions right, it'll tell you how to think about the secondary institutions. I, I now have the view, which I kind of always had a version of, that, that that's not absolutely true, because if you really, you gotta understand the, the, the difference between the primary and the secondary institutions might well be artificial. That really, they're all the institutions of the criminal law. They're all the institutions of tort law, you know, um, the, the rules governing who gets who can pay and how they can pay and the persons of who can make the claim and how they can make the claim, that, that's part of tort law too. They're not just secondary institutions that grow up in the shadow of tort law. And it's kind of an artificial thing to draw the distinction this way. Interpersonal or personal responsibility, we can understand better mm -hmm. what, what you are saying. But then the idea of accountability in this sense, and I have both, I will reply to all the questions, but I think I cannot find how you justify secondary obligations to the fact from there. From the fact that I am accountable to John, it doesn't follow in any way right. that I should make compensation and not apologize. Uh, the problem in all, in all our lectures that came up and is still here and we're going to be working. So the ascription is an answer to that. How? It's How? about ascribing you uh, the consequences for your actions. It, 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 ascription mean, I mean, entails uh, uh, you burden uh, the cost of what you do. That's what it's why? Well, does it explain why you have to compensate me? That is, uh, those things are partially conventionally set. I think that what we, what we all take for granted is that repair, right? The, re the repair is a kind, I think we, we have an idealistic view of the repair as actually making you whole or giving you uh, back what you lost or putting you in a position that you would have been in had this not happened. But actually, I think that that's actually not what happens. What, and in fact, it's, it's, I'm not sure that that would be right if that's what happens. What happens is where I get to demand of you an appropriate response. I, I get to demand of you something which is an appropriate response to what you did to me in failing me and harming me. And typically, we have good reasons for choosing some things rather than others. And the thing that we often choose, I think, is monetary damages. And those damages, I think, is a 
but the Hardwell issue just didn't even fly in that monetary community. And, um, and in addition, those things would be called for by press discussion. That is, it's part of what makes the, that particular response an appropriate response from among the many conventional responses we could have. It's not like it's the only conventional response we could have. We could have other responses. But isn't it that the idea of appropriateness is a little tricky here because we can get into the, the we, could, we, we could appeal to this new consideration. For example, I, I don't crash think Rockefeller's car. I don't think I'm very, very poor. No, My car is almost destroyed. Rockefeller is almost un, untouched. And maybe it's not appropriate that he demand compensation. Why would Many people would agree. It's not no, I don't think. No, that, 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 I mean, we need a theory of appropriateness and how mm -hmm. to think about what appropriate responses are. And I guess I'm inclined uh, to, that's a theory of, which is a deep, again, we get to a deep issue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and uh, that issue is this, what are reasons of the right kind, right? So, Well, it's to make the other person feel good. That's well, that's not a reason of the right kind for the feel good. It may or may not be a reason of the right kind. So the, the easiest cases are always things like belief, because the reasons of the right kind for believing are things that bear on the truth of something. Right? We we wouldn't have a. I mean, there are people who don't actually hold that view, but it's it that that's a view where we have less disagreement, right? Of something being a reason of the right kind. But what we're always asking for here, really, when all is said and done, is whether or not that's a reason of the right kind for imposing liability or determining the scope of liability, as someone would say. Whereas we think the loss I've suffered is a reason of the right kind. The fact that you injured me is a reason of the right kind for why you. But the question is that you're rich or poor is clearly not a reason of the right kind for the question of how much care I owe you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You can't think otherwise, right? That is, if you're really, really rich, I owe you more care because the loss is greater so that if I apply the learned hand formula, I should take more precautions, uh, in your case, but a poor person, I, I apply the hand formula, I should take less precautions. But you, you would reverse it in terms of utility because it is the disutility of the loss of the rich which is more and therefore it would seem to like... Well, then we don't, first of all, that you, you've got to be very careful when you talk about more or less with regard to utility. Judgments, yeah. So uh, I think it's just neater to use this. We don't really know what it would be, but the question is whether, uh, even if we use utility, the question would be, is that a reason of the right kind? However it comes out, right? It just not, doesn't appear to be a reason of the right kind. And I guess you guys are of the view that distributive considerations are reasons of the right kind for liability of judgments. The thing uh, is possible. I, I'm not defending them. Except well, don't, don't defend them. But I mean, <laughs> You're saying it's a possible view. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, well, if you mean by plausible, it's not incoherent. It's not totally unacceptable. No, no, it is. But the. Uh, <laughs> I'm, jo I'm joking. I'm joking. But I mean, so we're really asking in many ways what are reasons of the right kind? And that's, uh, you know, for things like our emotions and attitudes, those are pretty well developed theories. But for the uh, having kind of certain kinds of practical judgments, like whether to hold somebody liable and how much to hold them liable, uh, we don't have a fully well-developed view about what the reasons are of the right kind. Okay, I think before, okay. we, before we give him the last applause, I would like to thank you, all <laughs> of the participants, for coming here. I know it was a great effort for oh. all of you. Some of you came for long, long, uh, yeah, I, long I, I, Carlos and Martin especially. Yeah, I think John that's came amazing. From, came from England, but he made the longest and the ugliest you can make. Yeah. 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 Worst training at yeah. 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 so yeah. the Norman, yeah. 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 but it's never mind. Yeah. And Sachs yeah. yeah. took uh, <laughs> the, an awful flight, so he had to wait. What time? Four I, I, I had a beautiful flight. Who cares how 
then we're publishing with Jules reply to the paper, basically what he said here, uh, a book on Marcel Pons in Spanish. So the papers are already translated and checked, so we're just waiting for the, the reply response. To, yeah, the response to... Which I, I, I have surgery uh, in early January, and while I'm laid up and under an enormous number of painkillers, I will write the response. Well, that will explain the more exotic passages. <laughs> I'm just letting you know in advance. Yeah. And finally, I wanted to thank everyone in the organization here. George the first, because he's the one that makes things happen around here. Uh -huh. George Casa Via. <laughs> Given the economic situation in Spain, it's very difficult to find resources to do events of this magnitude. Yeah, magnitude. So George is one part. And all the people that work. Behind the camera, like Pablo Spetti, 